Today's guest is David Rosales. He's a dear friend of mine. Um, he's a, well, how would you describe yourself? He's an entrepreneur. Yeah, I identify as a um, writer first, personal trainer second. Um, so I say I'm a, I'm a writer, strength coach, personal trainer. Um, yeah, that's how I would describe myself. I can get deeper into my bio later. I'm not sure where we're going to go. Yeah. but So David is one of the most impressive individuals I've ever encountered. And I feel like I've been a decent amount of places, met a decent amount of people, but never have I met someone like David. So um, I kind of just wanted to get David on here so that I could ask, ask him some questions um, about. So what I'm doing is I'm doing this thing called the Conversations with Kelly in the hope that anyone who, who is following me can watch these and, and can be like, oh, I resonate with this story or this story and, and learn something from it, you know, and maybe get inspired along the way. Um, so I kind of just wanted to start out with, with you talking about your story, just, just your transition from being a really competitive hockey player to strength coaching into writing and now like writing as a job in New York City, going to NYU, um, are partying with with famous, uh, well, relatively famous entrepreneurs and all that. So why don't you start with with how you first went from hockey to strength training? Like, how did that happen? Okay, so growing up, I was a standard, let's call it jock, except I was also a huge nerd, which basically means that while the jocks were talking about basketball, I was reading chess books. That was really the only thing that distinguished me from a lot of those, like, you know, those typical athlete people. Was that hard for you? Like, like to, to in the hockey locker room, was it hard to connect with other guys? You know what? It definitely, as I got older, actually, it, it became more difficult where I had experiences for sure in my junior hockey career, which is like, like a pretty high level where I would have to like read books in corners because people would always, even if it was just like not, even if it didn't feel offensive to me or I was worried about getting bullied or anything, it was just like, oh, why is Rosie reading on the bus again? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are definitely challenges, but I also knew that like, all right, like I'm reading these books for a reason. I love it. I know what I'm learning. One thing that I fell in love with at a young age, actually, I'll, I'll share a story. When I was, which is related to this, <laughs> I was 16 years old. Um, my junior hockey team, I played for the Vermont Lumberjacks. I started there when I was 15, actually. Um, for those of you who don't know junior hockey, it's, it's pretty much a step above high school and below college. And it's for players who are 20 and under. And it's essentially where most future college hockey players get recruited from. So at 16, I'm, I'm playing junior hockey. I'm reading books on the bus and we, we have our team secret Santa. So this is around Christmas time. And my friend, my teammate gives me a book and, uh, he says, Hey, Rosie, that's my nickname comes from my last name, Rosales says, Rosie loves to play chess on the bus and he loves to read on the bus. So here's a book about chess. Everyone laughs, ha ha, hilarious. And the book was called The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Now, Josh Waitzkin has, has been one of my most influential thinkers. And in that book, it appears to be about chess and he outlines his chess career. But really it's about how he learned how to learn through the realm of chess. And then later, which he was like an international grandmaster and considered a prodigy in his youth, and then later, when he became a Tai Chi Hands world champion, which is crazy. And he wrote about how the lessons he learned from chess, such as learning to control the center, learning to take up space, applied directly to Tai Chi and how when he was doing Tai Chi, he felt like he was playing chess and vice versa. And when I read that book, I was like, oh my gosh, that is how my brain works. That is the type of learning I do. And I think one of my great strengths at a young age and then what's pivotal in my career is not that I'm really good at one thing. Like, yes, I'm a good strength coach. You know, I, I talk to NHL strength coaches. I can program with the best of them for the most part, but I'm definitely not the best in the world. And I'm a fine writer. I'm a decent writer, but I'm certainly not Ernest Hemingway. But my one of my strengths is my ability to kind of like take two or three different skill sets and combine them in a way that, that I don't think anybody else can. So there aren't many people who, who really have the writing acumen within the fitness space that I do. Bringing that back to weight skin, the type of work that I get excited about is really how to connect differing fields. And that shows up in my writing and in my coaching. In my coaching, a lot of my articles, I'll connect things like Harry Potter or, or things, terms like, like I wrote an article that was on the surface about an overused fitness term called bro science, but really it was about the scientific method and evidence and narrative and all these kind of complex terms that I think are hugely important. In my fitness coaching, it's not really about fitness coaching. 
Yeah. Right? If someone comes, if a young hockey player comes to me, he's like, Hey, I want to make the triple A team. I want to play in college. It's like, that sounds great. But then when we get deeper, it's really about something more. It's about how can you become a better person? How can you become a better contributing member of society? Like how can you become happier? Right? So it's always about taking one field, one goal and applying that across many different disciplines. Do you think as you've gotten older, you've realized it's actually about becoming a better human. It's not about becoming a better hockey player only definitely I think I see that I mean junior hockey is very competitive and just like every young hockey player I wanted to go to the NHL I wanted to play division one hockey but very quickly I think as most athletes learn even if you then get to that level it's kind of like then what like it yeah. is about something more and about something deeper and about something different right and so I've kind of shifted that if you can learn how to learn learn how to work hard learn how to sleep well, learn how to eat well, learn how to exercise through the lens of training and through your sport, then that's going to set you up for success in pretty much any field later on. I did not become a division one hockey player. I do attribute a lot of my abilities in terms of how to work hard, how to be disciplined to sport. And that's not, that's not uncommon. I think most athletes would say something along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you're playing competitive hockey in Vermont. Um, you're a 15 year old playing junior hockey, which is like pretty rare. Um, that's something that better hockey players do. I played high school hockey myself, but it's a little bit of a different, <laughs> different deal. I was willing to do it on the high school team. My high school is terrible. No, Kelly was a good player though, guys. Kelly was a good player. <laughs> I appreciate that. But anyways, so were you already writing at that point and doing fitness or, or did you start doing fitness because you were trying to get bigger for hockey? I always trained growing up. I loved training. It was Basically, my biggest asset as a hockey player was that I was in really good shape. And my last year in juniors, I was even my team strength coach. So, so her training was always a part of my life uh, from the age of like 13, 13 and up. When I graduated high school, I knew I was going to be playing junior hockey, which means I knew I was going to take a gap year. And so I was looking for something to supplement my, my junior hockey stuff. And it was very natural for me to go to the the owners of the gym I worked, I worked out at, uh, John and Sheila Swinsky at Fit to Excel in, in Essex, Vermont. And I said, hey, I would love to become a personal trainer. This is something I'm really interested in and passionate about. I've been watching YouTube videos of fitness people since I was 13, 14. I've been reading fitness blogs for years. And it became really natural for me to step right in. So right after high school, I became a certified personal trainer and jumped right into just training people, getting experience, teaching classes, one-on-one, -on -one, groups, teams, all that stuff. And with, without school, with that big void, my brain, which I'd always been interested in learning, was racing with things to say, with ideas, with ideas that I learned from being a personal trainer. And Fit to Excel, the gym I was at, had a blog. And, and I said, hey, I would love to write for the blog. They were like, great. And I started writing. What I learned when I first started writing, and this is something that I think is applicable to everybody, not just writers. We have this idea of writers as these great thinkers who have something important to say. So they write it down on a page, but that's not what writing was for me, especially at first. Writing was a way for me to clarify my thinking. It was, oh, I'm getting asked this question by tons of clients. What if I write out the protocol for how I could answer it? So like, you weren't even really a writer. It was more just to accent your train. Totally. Writing became, I also like to point out that in the fitness space, a pattern that I recognized was that the best trainers weren't just the best trainers. They're also the one best, meaning the ones we know of. They're also the ones who have big blogs, big social media followings, they write books. That's why we know who they are. Yeah. It's because like I talked about previously, they have more than one skill set. They're good trainers, but they're also great communicators. And even as a young person, that was something I knew I had to emulate. And as a young personal trainer, my success was intrinsically linked with how well I could communicate with people and get them to sign up and then get them to stay because they like me. And that is all communication skills as opposed to knowing X's and O's and sets and reps and fancy periodization schemes. I was actually talking to a girl recently who was a friend of mine who was like, I, I love fitness. I love working out. I would love to become a trainer, but I just have no idea where to start. And do you feel like having the humility to like just straight go to a gym and ask them, how do I do this? Like, you feel like that is what got you in the door or like how did you take that first step of okay I'm a fit hockey player now who likes fitness and now I'm a personal trainer like how do you connect that for me it was an interest I when I was 16 I loved I loved working out more than the average athlete loved working out and 
the gym I worked at was the gym I had been working out at since I was 12 or 13 years old. I knew the owners incredibly well. And the, yes, that's, that's pretty lucky that I was, I had this great opportunity to be thrust into the situation, but it's also, you know, networking and knowing people is, is important. So I would say if, if you want to become a personal trainer, then learn, start reading now, like you should already be reading blogs and reading good strength textbooks now, and then just start reaching out to people, you know, like yeah, learn, true. learn the gyms in your community, go say hi, say, Hey, I'm a young potential professional, you know, ask for like, if they have internships, like the best, there's a big misconception of strength conditioning that you have to do a lot of certifications and courses and schooling. And I think the most important piece to being a good uh, coach, being a good personal trainer is just training people because that's how you learn. It's, it's a field. And that's true for a lot of fields that hands-on is just more important than formal education. And yeah, that is absolutely. definitely true in, in fitness. That's how it is for videos too. I've noticed like film school, you know, you can only learn so much, but you just, you got to fail. Like you got to just get out there and, and test and see what works and see what doesn't work, you know? Um, okay. So now you're, you're doing some training for fit to excel and you're playing junior hockey at this point. So really quick, I want to touch on, was it a tough decision? So David left high school, like completely or left high school hockey? Like, did you get, I, I left high school hockey. So okay. my sophomore year, I decided to leave my high school hockey team and play junior hockey. Was that a tough decision or kind of a no-brainer? Personally, not that difficult. That was the type of person I was that I always wanted to play at the best level I could. And also for context, my high school was division two, which means the level was not particularly high. And as a freshman, I had already proved what I could prove at that level. <laughs> for those of you that don't know hockey, there's different tiers of juniors. Was there a part of you that was like, I just want to keep pushing like USA? I had it mapped out, Kelly. I had it mapped out. I had on a, on a journal entry from 2014, I had in 15, 16, I'm going to play here. And at 16, 17, I'm going to play here. And in 18, 19, it was, it was absurd. And of course it didn't work out. So yes, that was, that was where I was headed. And then my third year of juniors, I was, well, actually my second, my second year of juniors at 16, turning 17, I was already named the captain and I was one of the better players on the team. I had the hopes of moving up to the junior 18 that year and I got cut. Definitely a tough, tough, ex everyone has got cut is it's a tough experience, but it made me realize like, oh, wow, there's so much, so much more to life. My life isn't hockey and be how to cope, cope with failure. It's good to make plans. The plans aren't going to work out. And you're going to have to make a new plan. Do you still make plans? I'm a lot more hesitant to, and I actually think um, the field I'm in now in entrepreneurship, writing, even strength and conditioning, there is that time to say, oh, at this age, I'm going to be a coach for this team, or I'm going to be, be making this much money. I'm a lot more unattached to those goals right now. And I'm more focused on building skills and building relationships every day, every month, every year. And I think that's a healthier way to live. And also it's working pretty well. I think that's really smart. I don't have an age where I'm like, oh, I'm going to be an author at this age. Like I'm going to have a published publisher, publishing deal, all this stuff by this age. I just, I don't see the need for that. And is that just to manage failure or, or not set yourself up, I guess, to see it as failure or how come? Like, I, I think it's more so that I've seen, I've met authors who had book, had big book deals in their mid twenties. And I've heard of, heard a lot of authors who, you know, got book deals in their fifties and yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs who made a ton of money in their early twenties and then struggled later on. And a ton of people who struggled in their twenties and um, succeeded wildly later on it just speaks to the lesson that there is no one path I think one important uh, part to my journey is the fact that I took a gap year in that gap year I realized that oh wait there actually there's no rush to grow up there's no and there's also no reason to follow any particular path there's one thing of advice I give to young people all the time it's learn how to question the assumptions of the world around you. So we look at the education system. There's this assumption that, oh, I go to high school, then I go to college, then I go get a job that's based on what I studied in college. And it's actually doesn't really need to be that way at all. Yeah. It, I've taken a very unconventional path from after high school. In my career, like I said, I see people on all different paths. So I think my um, unattachment to goal setting stems from more my philosophy that there is no path you have to take and that everyone can forge their unique path. And like, that's what my tattoo is about too. And that, that's a big uh, key part of my philosophy. I think that's brilliant. You know, and I think that for me too, like I've taken a really unconventional path. And I, I do think that it gives you that perspective of like, wow, you know, I can, 
I can really be all sorts of things all at once, you know, and there's no rush. And I think that's super important because I feel like so many kids get stuck feeling pressure, you know. My career and my hockey, what I was doing with hockey were so intrinsically linked. Like, because I kept playing juniors, my last year of juniors, I got the opportunity to be the strength coach for all of the Lumberjacks teams, which is, which means I was a strength coach of my own team, which is probably the most incredible coaching experience I've ever had. And I don't think I'll ever have a harder coaching experience than literally coaching my own team. I loved being an athlete. And I still love being an athlete and uh, training like one and all that stuff. So, you know, obviously there were times where I didn't want to keep going, but it made perfect sense. It made perfect sense for me to finish out juniors. And then I decided to play division one club hockey at NYU academics first. It was the perfect academic and professional fit for me to move to New York city. And the fact that they have any hockey team here was just a bonus for me. I feel like you have this confidence in you. Where did that come from? Okay. This is a really good story. This is, this is my favorite story to tell. Can we be rated R here, Kelly? Yeah, absolutely. Can we have, can we have partial nudity? Yes. I encourage it. (laughs) This is me. (laughs) Okay. You guys, you may recognize everyone listening by my last name, Rosales, Rosales. It's, it's Spanish. My dad is from, and I am, this is going to answer the question, I promise. The question is, where did I get the confidence from? Yeah. yeah. Right? Basically. My dad is from the small Latin American country of El Salvador, and he moved to the U.S. when he was about, I think, five or six years old. Um, so he, Spanish is his first language, but he grew up speaking English. And my mom is a white girl from Massachusetts. All told, I grew up with this tan complexion. You know, I had a Salvadoran passport, um, but I didn't speak Spanish. And I was, I was really insecure about it. I was, I was super, super insecure about it in like in middle school and high school. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> super insecure. And I think a lot of, and a lot of like uh, biracial people um, have this like identity crisis. I definitely sort of had that where I was super American, but also this Spanish last name, didn't really know what to make of it. All I knew is I really wanted to learn the language. I couldn't really speak with my grandparents. I couldn't speak my grandparents in their native tongue. And it was hard for us to really like bond. When I was in eighth grade, my family, host an exchange student from Barcelona, Spain. And after he left for that, he was there for the whole year. And then after he left, he always said, hey, come whenever, stay with my family for however long you want. And so after high school, I recognized my privilege. I was super lucky. Um, I you know, saved up money. I was getting ready to work full time. And so I, I decided to go to Barcelona for four weeks in the summer of, of 2017. Wow. Now, wow. here I am thinking, great. Summer in Spain, I'm 18 years old, of course, all the fantasies come up that you'd expect from a young person, but you know, my, my, you, you know, my core philosophy, like it's about learning. And I'm thinking, wow, this is the best opportunity for me to learn Spanish. You know, if I can't go and live there for four weeks and come back speaking much better, like there's really no hope for me. Like there's no hope for me speaking Spanish. Like this, this is it. And I'd also been reading a book at that time by, aside from my mentor, um, the most influential thinker, uh, on my my philosophy in my life was it's Tim Ferriss and the books Tools of Titans and in that book Tim interviewed um, took the highlights of interviews from hundreds of world class performers and to tease out the the habits routines tactics of their success and one of the common threads was the ability to to be courageous and take action mm-hmm. and this can be summed up by Tim's quote which is a person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. I have quoted so I have, that to a lot of people. Though. I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> that quote. That did you, you hear it from me? First? Yeah, you told me that. Mm-hmm. You told me that in one of our late night talks in the city. And I have told that to a lot. And it, it hit me like probably nothing else hit me quote wise in a very long time. And but, it, it hits in a lot of situations. It hits yeah. in a lot of situations. So I'm on the plane. I'm hearing, all right, uncomfortable conversations. I need to get out of my comfort zone. I knew that that's what speaking Spanish would take. Because I knew I knew the grammar, like I took AP Spanish. So like, I couldn't really speak, but I knew all the grammar. But at the end of the day, learning languages is you need to just get reps because languages aren't something you can memorize. I don't want to go on a tangent on language learning too much, but (laughs) languages aren't something you can memorize. Languages are something you have to get used to. The way you subconsciously start to talk like your friends, that's kind of the way you have to language. You just have to get out there and get reps. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go to Spain. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone in every situation possible. I'm going to speak, speak, speak. I'm going to forget English. And I show up on day one. And Alvaro, that's uh, my exchange student. I call him my brother. We're, we're like brothers. We're not blood, but we're very close. I show up. He's like, let's go to the beach. It was an overnight flight. So it's like 10 a.m. their time. 
And so that's Gobi. So I'm like, this is great. So we walk about 10 minutes uh, to uh, this beach, this big Barcelona beach. And I'm from a small town in Vermont like you. I'm like, wow, this, this can exist, right? And so I'm looking out at this sea of people. You know, many of them happen to be, to be beautiful women. Were they and many of them, many of them happen <laughs> to be taller. Oh my goodness. So here I am. And please excuse the heteronormative nature of this tale. This applies yeah. to people. I believe this lesson applies to people of all um, genders um, and, and sexual orientations. Um, just that caveat there. But so I'm like, wow, this is, and I, my first thought is not look at all these beautiful women. My first thought is, wow, this is a perfect place to practice Spanish. All really? these strangers. You weren't like, wow, that's a lot of tits. Well, there might've been some of wow. Um, <laughs> but I remember thinking, all right, here I have, I have the opportunity to practice three skills. Not only do I have the chance to practice Spanish to get out of my comfort zone and become creators. I also have the opportunity to to get better at a skill which has plagued all of mankind, and that is to learn how to talk to girls, which admittedly at this point, objectively, I was bad at. I was objectively bad. <laughs> Ask anyone in high school who know me, who knew me. I was objectively bad at flirting and talking to women. Well, I think that you've come a long way. I'm just gonna say that. Well, thank you. <laughs> this is a big part of it. And Alvaro loved to sleep in, which meant he would wake up at like 2 p.m. I would wake up at like a normal time, like 9 a.m. And that means Basically the morning I had totally to myself. And so every morning I walked to the beach and the first morning I get there, I got my towel. I'm all soaked up. Like I'm literally like, I'm breathing heavy, just retelling the story. Right now. I was like, all right, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk Spanish girls. Yes, I'm going to do it. And I sat on my towel, you know, there probably weren't, there were probably 10 women within like a 10 meter radius, but like I couldn't even muster the courage to string together, like even 10 words together, honestly. So I was just sitting there and I didn't talk to a single soul for like, two or three hours. And here I am, I'm like, wow, I can't do this. And I think anyone who's like felt that uncomfort in conversation, like you all know what this feels like. And this, this uncomfortable feeling was the reason I couldn't speak Spanish, was the reason I wasn't good at talking to women. In a lot of the, maybe it was some of the reason I didn't have success talking to coaches in my hockey career. So the next day, so I go home and the next day I'm like, okay, I need to lower the stakes. I had a big ambitious goal. But just like breaking down any goal, you need to take baby steps. So I went in with the quota. I'm going to say one word to one person. That's my quota. That's and I think yeah. This is a good lesson also to always like, if you have a big goal, break it down into smaller chunks so that success is much easier and in some ways basically inevitable. So I'm sitting there on my towel, same kind of deal. I'm like, oh, I can't talk to them. And then this woman in a purple bikini walks by and I'm like, hola. And she just gives me this weird stare like, and then just keeps walking. And I'm just like, this fine. Like, yes, and I did it. <laughs> I got it out the way <laughs> so I just go home and call it down like this is a win today's a win wow. today's a win I, I have four weeks I'm like okay this is this is we're building up day three I go and I'm like all right I've said hi I said I did a couple olas it was good they're like they said hola back I'm like this is great like everyone's people are talking to me yeah, yeah speaking Spanish. I haven't said more than one word yet but this time I go up I go up to to a woman on a towel I'm like I got this I'm gonna do it and I say I'm not going to say in Spanish, I'll say it in English. I was like, hey, I'm trying to practice my Spanish. Can you help me? And that turned out to be a really easy, open. Like, yeah, of course. And I remember that first conversation. You always remember like the first and last yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, we had a great conversation about like the difference between Catalan, which is a regional language they speak in Barcelona and Spanish. And to, to summarize the rest of the story, I went back pretty much every morning, at least five days a week and just spoke and spoke and spoke. Like that so many reps in. <laughs> and there was no magic love story. I did not fall in love with the Spanish girl, the Spanish woman. Um, but I did have success in terms of learning how to approach people. Yeah. I learned how to get out of my comfort zone, right? In Spain. And I came back. I literally was dreaming in Spanish after four weeks. And this is where people are like, this is, you're, you're just a genius. I don't know how you do this in four weeks. I really attribute the, the fact that I did not speak English for four weeks straight. Like after, after those first few days, I got I really, and, and that is because of courage, right? In conversation with Alvaro, was with, with his parents, with his friends, it was all Spanish. And I came back, it's really hard to place value on how much it meant to me to talk to my grandparents for the first time in their native language. Wow. And to see someone like my grandfather, who was this really interesting person who worked as a diplomat for the United Nations, this man who had always had this aura around him growing up, but I could never access that. Yeah. To talk to him in his native language, it's really hard to put words on. But also, when I came back now working at a gym, 
it didn't matter whether I needed to reach out to get clients, whether I needed to get on my comfort zone and try to build relationships with people I might not have otherwise. There was nothing I could do in my personal training task, in my personal training career, that was harder than talking to topless women in a language I barely spoke, right? And so from then on, this is where did I get my courage from? From then on, anytime I faced trepidation or fear in the face of a daunting task, I could always say, at least we're speaking English and fully clothed. That's, that is seriously awesome, dude. Like, that is a, an amazing story. And so were you able to translate it? Like, do you feel like it, it actually feel long-term confidence? It's yes. From then on. And then it just, it just built on itself. And I was like, Oh, I know how to approach people. Yeah. Um, if, if to continue this lesson in one of the reasons I have to attribute a lot of my aura of, of the personality I have, a lot of it I've evolved in the last two years. Like Barcelona was a huge pivotal point for me. And then also moving to New York City and in, not just New York City and how magical it is, but in particular, one person I met in New York City and um, his name's John Romanello. If, if you're into fitness at all, you might actually know him. He was a New York Times bestselling author. He's one of the best writers I've ever had the privilege to read. Um, and now he has become my mentor, my biggest influence. Him and I work together very closely. But the reason I ended up connecting with him is because of the same lesson. So we fast forward about a year and a half from this. I've been now working full time for a year and a half. I'm like, I love training in person, but like waking up at 4.30 for a 5.30 class is not something I'm gonna do the rest of my life. So I'm, I'm thinking about my next steps. I'm thinking about colleges. I'm thinking about hiring, hiring someone. And then John Romanello advertised one-on-one -on -one writing coaching on his Instagram story. And it was $5,000 for three months. Now I was doing well as a personal trainer, but personal trainers can only do so well. Yeah. But my thought process was John Romanello is someone for other contexts. I'd followed him since I was literally in eighth grade. So I know what he's about. He's literally one of my childhood heroes. And it was the same thought process. Like I'm going to take the leap of terms of like, yes, it's different now that I'm spending money. But even if this doesn't work out in terms of like, I didn't expect us to build the relationship we have, but I am going to uh, invest in skills. I'm going to become a better writer and specifically for fitness. And I'm going to build a relationship because at this point I knew I was moving to New York city and John lived in New York city. And so it goes back to building skills and relationships and not being afraid to invest in those. And then supplementing that with the courage to then take the action on it. There's a really good quote from Graham Duncan. This comes from Tim's latest book, uh, tribe of mentors, Graham Duncan's billionaire hedge fund, smart finance guy. And it's, I, I invest a disproportionate amount of my income in an ever-growing collection of, of trainers and coaches. And so level one for me was approach people, develop courage. Level two was be courageous and invest in yourself. Right? Yeah, that's so, ah, oh, dude, always, bro, every time I talk to you, I get fucking fired up. <laughs> I get fired up every fucking time. It's beautiful, dude. You're a beautiful human. But anyways, keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so you're like, what is it about you? A lot of it is um, the people I, I am now very fortunate to surround myself with. I'm really fortunate to have a, uh, some great friends and, and brilliant people in New York City, um, but I'm really fortunate to know, to know John and then subsequently his network of, of brilliant people. Um, and so if there are another lesson to tie into this, yes, a, a lot of it is luck in terms of like things really worked out for me and for me and John in that whole scenario. But you know, the quote is, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And if I think about the five people I spend the most time with, all five of them, in my eyes, are incredibly impressive. And I've been really fortunate to kind of like, you know, seep, seep into like their, their, their successes, what makes them, what makes them good, what makes them good speakers, what makes them good writers, what makes them great in conversation, what makes them really empathetic in this way. And it's, as a writer, any writers will know that one of the things all writers do is we have commonplace notebooks where as we read books, we underline lines and we steal them, we put them in our notebook, right? And then you use them in your writing or when you're speaking. And that's not that different from the way we kind of absorb the people around us. And it's really not that different to go way back to the way we learn, we learn languages. We kind of just absorb, absorb the essence and, and tongue and style of the people around us. So in terms of like, why am I a much better speaker than I was two years ago or four years ago? A lot of it's just because I've surrounded myself with people who are good speakers. And that's just yeah. a lot of luck, but also understanding that your, your, your environment is, is huge. It, you cannot understate the importance of your environment. 
and do you feel like becoming an excellent communicator is something that you really want? Like you want to become someone who can communicate very well. Yeah, I think, look, we've talked about learning and, and language learning and, and courage, um, speaking, communication. These are all meta skills. So I'm, their skills are great. Specific skills are great. Knowing, for example, if you're an athlete, knowing how to stick handle is, is an important skill for a hockey player. But what I'm obsessed with is what I would call meta skills. And these are skills that improve all other skills. Yeah. Becoming a better speaker will literally make you better. At every, everything in your life will become better. Becoming a better writer will make you a better thinker, right? Becoming a better writer, better thinker, better language learning. These are, these are skills that transcend that discipline and that arena and make you better at everything else. So yes, I want to become a better communicator, but that's because communication to me is a meta skill. It's a skill that improves all skills. So another thing I, I tell a lot of my younger, my younger clients who are a lot of athletes, it's, it's invest in skills that transfer over. And to draw this to another like, concrete example, when I think about higher education. I think most, we can get into college and stuff. You, you want to go on this college education tangent? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So like college education, in my opinion, needs a rebrand. It's, it's been promoted as like, you pick a thing you want to study, and then you're going to get a job in that thing. And a lot of people who are anti-college say, well, that's dumb because that's not what ends up happening. And they're right in terms of that science of what's happening. That doesn't mean college is useless per se, yeah. because in college, you have a really good opportunity to learn how to human and learn how to learn. Yeah. In other words, learn meta skills that then you can take into any discipline because statistically we're all going to change careers. I'm already on my second career. I'm 22. So like, we're all like, we're, most of us are going to change careers. And in the 21st century, I'm a believer that the remote economy is not really going anywhere and that's only going to accelerate. And so for yourself in your self-education, but also for your college education, I would say to young people, consider um, focusing on skill sets that make you better at everything else. Learn how to write, learn how to communicate, those types of things. Um, like on the math science realm, learn how to understand statistics. Like those types of skills make everything better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I just want to continue on your story a little bit. So, because I feel like we're touching on incredible things along the way, but I feel like if we can keep going on the story, it'll be, it'll lead us in a good direction. So once you hit, so, okay, so moving to New York. So you're playing juniors, you're out of high school. Were you at a point where you were like, you know what? Um, I'm going to choose not to play NCAA hockey. I'm going to play club. I'm going to go to NYU. Was that a tough decision? It wasn't because NYU has a really cool program, which I'd mentioned. It's called the Gallatin School of Individualized Study. And as I mentioned, at the Gallatin School, every student makes their own major. So here I was a personal trainer. I knew I didn't want to do exercise science. I didn't need it. I'd become a competent trainer through books, through courses, through actually coaching people, through connecting with, with other great coaches. I had already, at this time, I had an internship with a top division one hockey team. I'd already coached my own team. Like I'd done a lot. And so when I thought about what I wanted to learn in college, it wasn't how to program exercise. Like I already knew that. Um, but I also didn't want to just do something super broad. I, in, that, in retrospect, something like studying English would have been pretty similar. Yeah. But what I opted for was a, a program in Gallatin where students make their own majors. And so every student in Gallatin has this unique blend of skills and this unique blend of interests where they exit the world into a skill set that no one else has. And that's their philosophy, the interdisciplinary philosophy. And I was instantly drawn to that. I was like, this is, this is the program. This is the place. If I'm going to college, this is where I'm going. And like from then on, um, I applied, got in, hired John moved to New York, started working for John, started doing school, and here we are. Was there any part of you that was thinking about not going to college? Yeah, um, and this is where college gets complicated because um, the inflation price of college has gone up some absurd hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of percents over the last several decades, and the product is the same. There's no other commodity on the planet that has that kind of price inflation. Uh, and NYU is really expensive. I was fortunate to get a partial scholarship, um, but I have to recognize my privilege here and that my grandfather paid for my father's college. It was always part of, of our familial culture that they would pay for my college. And so for me, it made an easy decision. I reflect on, well, what would I have done if I had to pay for my own college? 
And it's hard to say whether I would have taken out loans to go to NYU, whether I would have hired John, moved to New York City, and just done what I'd done anyway without college. And in that, it's hard to speculate what would have happened. Did I think about not going? Yes, but at the end of the day, with the support of my family, that didn't really make sense. I totally recognize my privilege um, in having that kind of easy choice to make. And I totally, um, does anybody who wants to talk about like, what do I do about college? Um, I'm happy to like answer questions because like, this is something, this is a decision you should not take lightly. And there's no right answer. There's absolutely no right answer. There's no one path for everybody. Uh, but the fact that you're asking, if you're, if you're listening and asking, should I go to college? What should I study? What's my path? The fact that you're asking those questions and question the assumption that you just go to college, you're already on the right track. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Like Kelly, because for you, like your college experience was vastly different than mine, right? Yeah. And you know, you and you don't have a degree, and that's fine for you right now. And like maybe at some point you will go graduate. Maybe at some point you won't, right? But but yeah. but again, you're another great example of like there's no one path. It's the only yeah. path that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's it's just interesting to see. I feel like college and, or not college, it's one of those things where it is what you make it. And, and if you take advantage of college, you will do great. And if you don't take, if, if you don't go to college and you take advantage of life, you'll do great. You know what I mean? Like either way, the ball's in your court. And that's what I really realized with myself, you know, it's like, it's all about what, well, what am I going to do about it? You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you know, and, and you can't really choose your circle, like with you, your parents were paying for college. What are you going to do about it? Take advantage of it, you know? And, and for people that that's not the case, like, what are you going to do about it? Take advantage of it, work, find your way. <clears throat> you know what I mean? And so I think that I'm just a big, big believer in, in accountability and just in terms of like the balls in your court, if you don't like how your life is, you know, you got to change it yourself. You know what I mean? And I think that that's something that we both done even though we both it's easy to say because we both have had privileged upbringings but I think that you know you have that power in, in any scenario to really control your mind and and work on yourself you know what I'm saying totally and like I recognize my privilege you recognize your privilege but you know I think the only personal there's a lot to be said for personal responsibility now you're so you're going to NYU you're working in the city connected with John do you feel like there's still a lot for you to learn and a lot for you to discover about yourself in terms of your career or do you feel like you know what I'm I'm gonna build from here and I know exactly where I'm going I'm trying on different hats of who I am as a writer when I like kind of copy that right? like right now I'm uh, I do this I think it's a good a lot of writers do this you I'm reading I read one author and I binge everything they wrote and I'm reading a, a lot of Hemingway right now and my prose the last few weeks has been like a lot more terse a lot more tight like a lot a little bit of Hemingway in there so I think it's fine to imitate. You have to imitate before you innovate. And like, I have plenty of years ahead to forge who I am going to be uniquely. And I think at 22 years old, try on different hats. Like I'm, I'm trying on the Salinger hat in my writing. I'm trying on the Hemingway hat. I'm trying on the Romanello hat. I'm trying on the, the Tim. If the way I ask questions in my podcast are they're pretty much all stolen from Tim Ferriss. Like I pretty much just steal from his podcast. Yeah. Um, so I think the young people, like you're going to be you like, and, and me is maybe a collection of all of those different experiences. Well, you touched on that you're yourself, no matter what, you know, I think that's really smart because like, you're right. You know, you are right. Gallatin is where it's like, you can't be like anyone else. Everyone is so them. Do you feel kind of done with the fitness end and you want to be more of a writer fully, or do you feel like you like the balance? That's a good question. I think at some, if I were to, if I, someone were like, do you see yourself working in fitness 15 years from now? I would probably guess that I wouldn't be. Um, but who knows? I do love fitness. I love, but I love it not because I, I give a crap about like, who's the best athlete on the planet. Like I'm not as motivated by like, oh, I want to make this athlete 0.11% better. That's not as motivating to me as seeing like a high school athlete who comes to me. And then two years later, they're not only much better athletes, their confidence is higher because they, like made the made the junior team or made the triple a team or are getting recruited by colleges now um because they become more confident speakers because they've learned how to sleep better you know we've like really dialed in their bumble profile so they're just crushing it like life's <laughs> that that's what that's what gets me going yeah in terms of and and and, and um fitness and strength conditioning and personal training has been a, a beautiful outlet for that i also love what i what i am in in the hockey space which is like I'm, you know, I've already ghostwritten a fair amount specifically for trainers because like, like I said earlier, there 
are not very many people who know fitness who can also write. And so I, I didn't think- even know that was a thing. Oh yeah, that's a thing. Most, if anyone out there has written a book by a celebrity, I'm going to tell you a secret. They didn't write it. Someone else wrote it for them. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, I don't, I'm not going to name drop, but yeah. Do you think even presidents and stuff, do you think they wrote their own? Okay, so this is interesting. This is a thing. So Barack Obama, the reason it took so long to write his autobiography is because he wrote it himself. And Barack Obama is a, a great writer. And his book's actually, he's very well. He's, he's great. But like traditionally, no. Most presidential biographies are, are autobiographies are ghostwritten for sure. But I mean, it, the way it works, it's so is, it's so well, if anyone's curious about ghostwriting, they can talk to me about how it works and I'm happy to explain it. Fast forward five years. What's David Rosales's dream life? It's the same, except I don't have to do school and I get to spend all day writing articles that I'm really, really excited about. So like teaching people how to distinguish narrative from evidence, those types of things come from meta-learning and learning how to learn and learning how to think. And so when I think about my life, it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. I think that's, that's the area where at least right now I see myself like being involved because I think it can help with a lot of issues and help one person at a time. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Appreciate David. it.